Hey, Feminist Frequency Radioheads. Fall's upon us and times are pretty uncertain. But you know what is a sure thing? Each week, the Feminist Frequency crew will be here to chop it up and talk over each other about what's been happening each week in the world of pop culture and media. And you can be part of making the media criticism you love. You can! Head on over to patreon.com slash femfreak and become a patron of all this tasty feminist media analysis. Backers of the podcast get early access to show episodes, merch discounts, exclusive bonus hijinks, and need us pickling recipes and more. Check it out. Patreon.com slash femfreak. Road trips, you know, roadside burger stands, Americana, it's stuff that often at least um, white people think of in very positive, like upbeat terms. These experiences are never available to black people in the way they are to, to white people. Black people cannot escape American racism. Welcome to Feminist Frequency Radio. This is the show that asks you to be critical of the media you love. I'm Anita Sarkeesian, and I'm joined today by two women who would really rather not stay in your big, creepy, elegant manner. Thank you very much. Carolyn Pettit. Absolutely not. And Ebony Adams. Oh, I would be fully living that moving on up montage, at least for a little while. So, <laughs> sure, sure. You know, sure. I'm not here for a long time. I'm here for a good time. So I'll take it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> this week, we're going to be talking about the HBO limited series Lovecraft Country. Stay tuned. Hello, friends. Hey. Hello. So, you know... I woke up this morning and I heard that another black man was shot in this country, which yeah. always is always hard um, and it keeps happening. And I was like, do we want to record an episode of the podcast day and talk about pop culture shit when like what, you know, whatever. And I, and I was just like, well, it's thematic. <laughs> like What we're talking uh, about today yeah. is very intertwined with like the realities of our life at this moment. Or yeah, not if we my, weren't recording like, this this episode this week, I probably would have been like, yep, I can't do it. You yeah. know, it's just it's too much. I can't, you know, pretend as if um, the the trauma that, you know, is flowing through my increasingly clotted blood right now, you know, is not the only thing that I'm wanting to talk about or capable of talking about right now. Um, like, well, I it, just. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's too much. It's it's too much. And. It is it is a crime that um, we and I don't mean we here, you know, on this podcast, but, you know, the aggregate we um, can move on from this, that this is one more um, that it's not even big news. Most places, you know, um, like there are some outlets you'd be hard pressed to find any mention of it at all um, and that there is a palpable sense that people are waiting to for the moment when they can, you know, not think about it anymore and they can move on to other things. And it's, you know, I'm struggling. I'm having a hard time. Yeah. Um, also, t today at the uh, RNC, um, there was a moment where uh, Trump was, you know, he mentioned Obama in some context and someone in the audience shouted out an extremely racist mm -hmm. uh, term in that context. And Trump, um, of course, just sort of, you know, laughed and said like, hey, let's be nice and said something like only in South Carolina, which is, of course, absurd because racism is at the heart of America as as an as a whole, um, but you know, no outright condemnation, nothing at all, just a, a kind of good natured. Um, hey, now, hey, don't, hey, nah, let's not. Um, yeah. So uh, you know, um, just uh, also, so I, which also sort of uh, um, was horrifying in its own way, and also ties into um, what this series is, I think, really trying to confront, which is the mm -hmm. the racism you know, that um, at best only ever hides under a very thin veneer um, at, at the top of the surface of what we, of what we call America, if it hides at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, that is a great segue <laughs> into this, but I'm going to ruin it. I'm sorry. No, no. Um, I, one thing, and, and maybe we talk more about like, you know, maybe in the bonus or later or freakouts or whatever, but I, I just started thinking a little bit more today and, and kind of, building on what Ebony's talking about of like, 
how do we deal with the constant outrage um, and like the outrage fatigue that's happening around this, right? Ebony, you're talking about like, it's not even making headlines in some places and that, that that's, you know, that we, we're mm-hmm. as a society maybe, or as just as not black people um, are, are kind of tired of it, <laughs> which is, and I, I'm not saying that I feel that way. I'm saying that like, I think that this is a, a challenge to grapple with when you're like, oh, another one. Right. And we're talking about like another human is being shot in the streets by the police, right? Another black man, another black person. And so I, I just, I, I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to say other than I think that both about how, like, how do we navigate what it takes to make real change, what it takes to not let this become like normalized for us, even folks who, care, um, whether allies or is affected by it. Like I read your, this morning, Ebony, you posted about how you're afraid to go on runs, Mm -hmm. um, because of reasons, which you can explain if you want. And I was just like, yeah, how do we like this reality is real for people. It's existing. Mm -hmm. It's constant. It's never ending. It is, it's affecting us. And like, how do you just do another episode of a podcast about the fucking, about a TV show or whatever, you know, like how, how do you, how do I, how do you do, just do your life? How do we do our lives right now? Um, I don't know. That's what I'm. Yeah. yeah I, my, my answer, which is not an answer is that you don't, you know, like it is, it is a, it is a fallacy. Um, you know, it is an illusion to think that we can, and I think that has become like increasingly apparent, you know, like the center cannot hold, um, you know, <laughs> making a nerd reference there, not talking about like center politics. Um, I, I I think that, you know, the the ruptures um, are becoming so clear that I, I don't know that there there is a way to kind of like, you know, meld um, you know, kind of like a a non radical, you know, like abolitionist, anti capitalist, you know, anti white supremacist life to what is termed like kind of you like normal existence, where you know you're able to you know think about the fact that you just want to watch the new Star Trek Discovery series, or you know what are you going to have for dinner, or whatever. Like there's there's no separation there, you know. And the fact that we thought that there was one is is a lie, a convenient lie that we tell ourselves. Um, I, I don't think there is an answer, but I I don't, I, and certainly over the next three months in the U.S., I think that's you know just going to become more and more apparent. I'm I'm worried for us. I'm worried. Yeah. All right. Well, get into it, people. Okay, I'm going to introduce uh, the topic that we're talking about, and I think this will get into. I think the conversation we just started having will be interwoven with mm-hmm. the themes of this mm-hmm. show. Um, so, helmed by Misha Green and produced by Jordan Peele, Lovecraft Country is a new limited series on HBO based on the novel by Matt Ruff. It begins as Korean War vet and lover of pulp fiction, Atticus Freeman returns to his hometown on the south side of Chicago after receiving word that his father had gone missing. Waiting for Atticus is a mysterious letter from his father suggesting that he went to Artem, Massachusetts, to investigate his late wife's ancestry. Along with his uncle George, who produces travel safety guides for black motorists, and his friend Letitia Lewis, Tick sets out for Artem. Not knowing that the deeply racist stories of cosmic, otherworldly horror H.P. Lovecraft set in that region may be more than just stories. Their journey is a strange odyssey in which Norman Rockwell-like images of Americana have their underlying white supremacy laid bare, and the horrors of racism become blended with the eldritch horrors of Lovecraft's work. So today, we're going to be talking about the first two episodes of the series. Um, yeah. I, <laughs> oh. I loved the show, mm-hmm. um, the two episodes that we've seen. The first episode in particular yeah. is such a gut punch of an achievement. You know, from the very beginning um, that is, you know, like sort of deliberately, um, you know, calls up imagery of like classic war cinema, um, you know, sort of like this sepia toned black and white, you know, um, traversal of, uh, of of a trench. 
you know, and just like this cacophony of, you know, gunshots and, you know, men yelling and, you know, bayoneting each other and just, you know, what we have come to expect from like, you know, like the the minutia of of what it takes to to wage war on other human bodies. And then this, you know, literal sort of like ascendance into technicolor, you know, as the character of, you know, who we will come to know is is Atticus, like comes over the top of the trench and literally ascends into color. And this like, what is, you know, literally like a, a, a pulp, uh, magazine, comic, novel cover, you know, with like UFOs flying around and just like, you know, um, like candy colored, you know, alien woman descending from one of the UFOs and the, you know, the tentacled monsters. It's like, it is such like immediately within, within two minutes, you know, I was like, yep, I'm in for this, no matter where the story is going <laughs> to take me. And did, I mean, did you I like knew. Jackie Robinson coming in and trying to save the day? I, I absolutely loved it. I mean, you know, <laughs> at the very beginning, like you don't know um, what you're in for, right? When you first see that kind of like black and white war um, segment that opens it, you don't know what you're in for. And so to have that like, you know, seemingly sort of like effortless turn um, into this even more of a, you know, what we learned is a dream landscape was just fantastic, you know? Um, and it just, you know, I love this evocation of dream logic and that, yes, you know, like, of course, Jackie Robinson will bust through <laughs> and save the day and be like, I got you, kid, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I just thought it was fantastic. There's a great conversation that Atticus has a short while later um, uh, in, in the opening episode. So um, the bus that he's on breaks down and, uh, you know, he and uh, other Black passengers are sitting at the back of the bus. The bus breaks down. People you know, come to pick up the other white, uh, the white passengers to take them the rest of the way to Chicago. But Atticus and, you know, just, I think they, and the other black passengers just sense that they are not welcome to, to Mm -hmm. crowd in these smaller vehicles with white, you know, passengers. So they wind up walking, um, who know, you know, some significant distance to be sure. And, on that walk, um, you know, Atticus is talking to this uh, woman, black woman who was on the bus. And, you know, he shares that, that a book he's reading, part of what fueled that amazing opening mm-hmm. dream sequence with the UFOs and Cthulhu and Jackie Robinson and everything, is a John Carter book. Um, John Carter was a pulp, you know, like he, he, fictional pulp hero who who inspired you know, just tons of, of, uh, her, you know, other pulp heroes as well. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, he, Atticus mentions he's a Confederate, he, you know, soldier or ex Confederate. And the woman kind of challenges him on this. And, and, you know, like you're reading it, he's a, he's a Confederate. Like you can't like, you're never an ex Confederate. Like, like that's, you know, she's basically saying like, that's mm-hmm. fucked up. And Atticus, uh, says something like, Stories are like people, loving them doesn't make them perfect. You just try to cherish them and overlook their flaws. And she responds, yeah, but the flaws are still there. And I just mm-hmm. thought that was a really great, first of all, kind of um, little little succinct kind of summary of, of attention that we, that feminist frequency has long dealt with of like, right. you know, loving stories. Yeah. But where is like the limit? Like, where is it like no longer okay to be into something um, or, you know, where, and, and also like, I think it's also saying something about America as this series will go on to explore it of like, yeah, you can like love America or whatever, but you can't pretend that it's not deeply ra- you can't pretend that the flaws of racism are not there like they are still there and you can never forget you know or you that they're that they're there mhm um have are either of you actually familiar with the writings of hp lovecraft uh i have this is interesting I don't read and have not read much H.P. Lovecraft precisely because of his incredible, profound, obvious, virulent racism. While I nevertheless have read much, uh, much work that has been inspired by H.P. Lovecraft, you know, there's a there's a very real sense um, 
you know, among people who read like speculative fiction, that H.P. Lovecraft's influence is rather more outsized than his actual work would have produced itself. It's really what people have done with, you know, the Cthulhu mythos, um, you know, like Carol mentioned, like the eldritch horrors um, that is really responsible for, you know, it's kind of enduring popularity uh, in pop culture. Were it left to just, you know, H.P. Lovecraft himself, who was, you know, a... A, a wonderful sort of like, you know, ideas person, but in terms of like craftsmanship, not particularly great on a lot of levels. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. Feel free to at me at Ebony Astor to, you know, disagree. Um, but it's really more, you know, um, people who came after who who really set the stage for for, you know, the the enduring popularity of his stuff. I have read a lot of Edgar Rice Burroughs, though. I have read a lot of John Carter of Mars books. Does that count for anything? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, those are also incredibly <laughs> racist, but yeah, you know, I did. I did do a lot of stuff I didn't like when I was writing my dissertation. Um, I think it's interesting to note that um, the, the so um, Atticus's uncle, um, uh, played by the great Courtney B. Vance, um, his name is uh, George George Freeman, is in this. Um, in this series, he 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 creates a, a fictional stand-in, you know, for the for the you know the Green Book of of note, mm -hmm. which of course inspired like the or the that re deeply racist uh, uh, best <laughs> the, picture winner. It's and, it's like, <laughs> and it's like here is a story that actually centers black people that that uses that as a plot point, and it's like already just like infinitely more interesting and more insightful in terms of its exploration of racism in America than that, you know, shitty movie um, ever was. Right. So I just, I, I love that, 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 that is a, an element in, in this, uh, in this series. Yeah. Oh yeah. The, and the, again, in the first episode, there's this wonderful scene in which, okay. So uncle George is married to, um, Oh, God, I'm blanking on his wife's Hippolyta. name. Hippolyta? Hippol Hippolyta. Yes, Hippolyta, you know, played by the wonderful Ingenue Ellis. And so, you know, she's saying, um, you know, hey, maybe I'll go on this trip because, you know, I write up the descriptions of these places from, you know, to imagine how good this could be if I actually got to, you know, write my own notes for these. And, you know, justifiably concerned, George is like, now, nah, you know, this is this is something that I got to do. Like, it's not safe for, a, you know, a single woman um, to be to be riding, to be traveling alone. And of course, the unspoken part of that as audience members, you know, is that we're saying like and it is, you know, doubly dangerous for a single black woman. It's it, I mean, it's nobody's picnic for George to be doing this by himself. But but Hippolyta would be even, you know, would be even more vulnerable. But so then we transition to a later scene in which, you know, um, George and Atticus and Letty um, are getting ready to take off and and Hippolyta is going through the checklist. And it is heartbreaking to watch them go through in this very like, you know, kind of bubbly, affectionate way, the things that they have to take with them, knowing that this checklist is designed to keep George alive on the road because, you know, he cannot depend upon finding a place, a motel that will rent to him. He cannot depend upon finding, you know, a restaurant or a diner that will serve him food. He cannot depend upon finding, you know, a friendly mechanic or car shop, you know, should something to happen to his car. We have to carry so much and be ready for so much. And the way that this has be just become, you know, um, accepted and assumed, and it's like, uh, and and the the Herculean task that he and other black people have set for themselves to make things safer for other black people who come after them, I just felt like it was so wonderfully done that scene because you know we've all taken road trips and it's like okay do we have everything do you got like you know your corn nuts your Gatorade <laughs> the map you know whatever you know trips you took as a family but Hippolyte is like do you have a mattress you know do you have fl flares you know what I'm saying yeah Abs absolutely absolutely, absolutely. um. And also part of that scene that I, I enjoyed too was the daughter gives him um, oh. an episode. Like she she's writing this comic and mm -hmm. she gives him a like a what's not an, an issue of the comic every time he goes out on the road. Yeah. Um and just the the, the humanity building of that mm -hmm. family, um, of like the the love and care for each other, the inspiring the creativity in that child, which mm -hmm. you know is sort of set to contrast the way that Tick uh, is raised, right? A little right. bit, um, but 
Yeah, that scene was amazing. I feel like this show really, it's, uh, the point of the show is not subtle, but there are a lot, a lot of very intentional pieces of dialogue and, and, Mm -hmm. um, imagery that is used to help, uh, convey the fullness of these characters and the fullness of this world in a way that makes it kind of what we think about when we think about like really high quality television. Um, and, and like little things, um, that, there are lots of little things. This is not a major one, but um, when we meet Letty, who is a photographer, um, her sister Ruby is a musician. And, you know, I think that I was sort of taken seeing this one, this black woman with a guitar. Like usually mm-hmm. when we see women from this period who are singers, like, um, um, actually, I don't even know if this is the same period, but I'm thinking of like Ella Fitzgerald, right? Or like mm-hmm. like folks that are like these these amazing revered black female singers, like they're not usually considered musicians, quote unquote. And having mm-hmm. her be a singer and a guitarist, like I don't know, something about that stuck with me. I I I, I valued yeah. that. Yeah, I think like it was it's an it's an obvious allusion to people like Rose, Sister Rosetta Tharp, right? Mm-hmm. You know who widely acknowledged as being one of the you know forebears of rock and roll music. But yes, they absolutely get left out of you know, like mainstream read white histories. Um, I loved, you know, um, that character, Ruby. And I I love how, okay, one thing I will say about this show um, is that as wonderful as I found it, as you say, Anita, it's it's not a subtle show. You know, like there are, there are moments where, you know, there's like key information, you know, that is offered in kind of those, the most like, obvious expository dialogue and if they don't think that you've got it they will come back to it you know um but one of the moments that i thought actually was you know pretty fantastically done was the you know exchanges between ruby and letty you know and we see so much play out because ruby is a darker skinned she is a bigger black woman you know and she owns that stage and she is working that crowd and they love her but then when offered you know a performance by letty her sister who is also gorgeous but who is much thinner and who is much lighter you see you know the the tension in Ruby's face, knowing that like, you know, there's a bunch of like colorism at play, you know, within the black community and knowing that like, you know, Letty represents perhaps a more like, you know, standardized version of beauty that she has not attained, you know, like there's so much going on in that scene. It's really multi-layered and this the show at its best does that so often. Yeah. It's also just beautifully shot. Like mm. this show is so, so cool to look at. Yeah. Like it's gorgeous. The the reason I asked about uh both of your experiences with HP Lovecraft um mm-hmm. was because so I I don't I've never read any of his work. Um I honestly what I know of him is that he's racist. Like I feel like that is mm-hmm. like his enduring legacy is that he's an extremely racist person. Um and whether it was in his I didn't even know if it was like explicitly in his work or as an individual. Like that's how much I don't know about Lovecraft. Um mm-hmm. I the book I recommended a couple weeks ago, The Outside was um described as Lovecraftian, which uh, I remembered because Ebony, you were talking about how his influence has been so mm-hmm. so much broader. Um, mm-hmm. But I don't even really know what any of that means. Like, I just, you know, yeah. it's it's one of the things that's in the world. And so for me, watching this show, I don't think that the show is inaccessible at all. I think that it explains to you everything that you need to know to understand what's happening. But there is a part of me that's like, man, would I get more out of this if I understood the subtleties or if I had any experience with Lovecraft's work? So in a mm-hmm. in a nutshell, I think part w- something that's really uh, associated with Lovecraft, you know, um, in terms of uh, like his his brand of horror are um, these kinds of cosmic entities. Um, mm-hmm. So like Cthulhu, you know, these um, I guess like vast kind of gods um, that uh, in his fiction are often worshipped by uh, like cults and things like that, and who you know, uh, represent things that are, that are like almost beyond the ability of human beings to, to comprehend or contemplate such that like, you know, it's often written that, that like for any human being to actually look upon Cthulhu, like because of Cthulhu's form, simply looking upon Cthulhu would drive any human being, um, you know, insane essentially. So, you know, Mm -hmm. like, 
cosmic things that that rend the fabric of reality and that exist like beyond our ability to perceive or comprehend things so, things like that. So in the second episode where they are dealing with this this basically clan cult um that that is apparently uh, too high never associate with the clan right <laughs> <They're too poor. laughs> um but their magics and their obsession with uh, immortality and all of that like is that lovecraft or is that added um, it's definitely lovecraftian yeah um, okay okay I, and i think maybe the order what is it, the order of the sacred dawn might appear um in some lovecraft stories but like lovecraft himself you know offered like a, a pretty expansive um you know, kind of cosmology, but it was just further, further, like, you know, blossomed under, you know, other writers and artists such that it's hard to know what is originally Lovecraft and what is Lovecraftian. Like the term Lovecraftian, you know, has come to denote these things that if they, whether they appeared in like actual, you know, like the actual canon of, you know, Lovecraft's work or not, are so heavily associated, you know, it's as if, they, you know, they're from the same family. And that stuff definitely appears in Lovecraftian works. Got you it. know, as Kara said, like these, you know, disciples and worshipers of these these cosmic figures who are, if not like um, completely heedless of humanity, are like actively antipathetic to humanity. Like the notion of like a loving, you know, Christian God or something is completely foreign um to this to that kind of work got it you know yeah so after so we've only watched the first two episodes cuz that's all that has come out and like the first episode i was like you know i i was very intrigued and interested and you know there's mm -hmm. all the stuff happening and i was like i have no idea where the show is going <laughs> like mm -hmm. they at the end of the first episode they show up at this house and you're like what the fuck so i so you know if someone was like what do you think of the show i'm like i don't i don't know what it is yet right like i'm mm -hmm. curious i also feel that way <laughs> at the end of the second episode mm -hmm. like i just i feel like so then you had the it's almost like I don't think the show is standalone or episodic, but like it feels that way so far. Like mm -hmm. that, you know, they're on this journey, but that there's like a, a, a battle in each of the episodes. And so I don't like, do they go back home? I think they do from a, the little bit that I read, but I'm just like, I don't know where the show is going. Yeah, my which I is have interesting. Not read the book upon which is based by Matt Ruff, but my understanding is that it's like um, sort of loosely connected. Um, stories, and so that's what we'll be getting in the rest of the series. Oh, and I think the next okay. episode or two involves Letty, yes, going back to Chicago, and she. This is not a spoiler. This is in like the episode description. Buying like this, you know, um, um, this three story tenement house that's meant to be kind of like an oasis and sanctuary for Black people on the north side of Chicago, and then has to deal with like uh, the haunting that comes from the the previous owner. So I think like we will see you know, other, these characters um, or, you know, these themes pop up throughout the rest of the season. But I don't think we're going to get necessarily like a return to, you know, um, Atticus fighting the Order of the Sacred Dawn or whatever. Okay, and speaking that of Atticus, sense. can we just shout out <laughs> Jonathan Majors, who was amazing in The Last Black Man in San Francisco. Yeah. Might have been my favorite performance in that movie. And so good here, too. Oh, my God, this... This show, I can't wait to see what's going to happen. I love an ambitious show because even when it like, you know, doesn't quite make the mark, you just really get the sense that they are trying for something, you know, and they are doing something new. Like there are weird things that happen, particularly in the second episode. I mean, at least for me, um, where it felt like, you know, like when the um, the three travelers are seeing these false images of of other people. So Letty is seeing a fake version of Tick. Um, George is seeing a fake version of um, Atticus's mother. Um, Atticus is seeing, you know, this version of this Korean soldier that he killed when he was at war, whatever. The way that it's edited and put together, I was like, I have no idea what's happening here. Like, it took me a while to figure out, like, oh, this is fake. <laughs> right, right. As Ebony says, like the the love for an ambitious show, and and for me, this show is so just potent conceptually. Like just mm -hmm. that the whole idea of using like Lovecraft's you know Lovecraftian love, Lovecraft tinged horror, and like taking the fact that that Lovecraft was a racist and there's racism embedded in his work, but using it to kind of turn that to turn that back upon itself and tell this story that fuses 
like Americana with that. It's it's just so exciting conceptually that even when, like, I didn't love the second episode, but I'm so jazzed just by the concept of this show that I know I'm going to keep watching. But yeah. there's like, there's stuff that particularly the first episode does that I found so exciting and so, so just, um, just electrifying. Um, like for instance, there's a sequence where, um, and, and this show does some really interesting things with audio. I think that's going to yeah. be a, a trend throughout mm-hmm. this episode, but the first real instance of this is in, in the first episode is there's a, you know, a sequence where it's just the, 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 the station wagon Woody at it, as it's affectionately referred to cruising along, you know, some stretch of road under, you know, great big American sky. Um, and like, whose voice are we hearing on the soundtrack? But James Baldwin, like Mm -hmm. um, uh, as a part of his uh, debate, like a very famous debate that he participated in arguing about like the American dream and whether how accessible or inaccessible it is to black Americans or how it's built on the backs of black Americans. And, you know, as the sequence is happening um, or, you know, in audio, you're hearing James Baldwin talk about this like. They stop at this very, like, quintessential Americana, like, roadside burger stand or something. Like, a, totally something out of, like, a Norman Rockwell painting. And are, vi- you know, ex- they're accosted in extremely racist ways by other patrons there. And, I don't know, to me, that whole sequence was just so exciting for the ways in which it's, you know, I mean, road trips, you know, roadside burger stands, etc. is all, like, again, it's all, like... Americana, it's stuff that we norm that often at least um, white people, you know, we as white people think of in very positive, like upbeat terms. But to, it's it's just so exciting to me to see these it, these images and to have mm-hmm. them subverted in this way that forces the viewer to really confront the fact that that these experiences are never available to black people in the way they are to, to white people, that the, that all of this, the American dream, the American, just like the pleasure of, of Americana as, as such is, is not, you know, it's, a, it's like this very white thing because, because black people cannot escape, um, you know, the American racism. Um, mm-hmm. Anyway, so yeah, I just thought that use of the of the Baldwin audio was so was so thrilling in that sequence. Yeah, the between the use of the Baldwin audio in the first episode and then um, Gil Scott Heron y- yes. audio in the second um, right episode, um, which gives the episode a title "Whitey's on the Moon." Like, there's just again, there's so much ambitious stuff that's being done here. Um, and I mentioned, you know, at the top of the show, like the second episode starts with. Um, Lady and George dancing around to um, the theme song from the Jeffersons <laughs> while they're in that incredible looking lodge because they've they've lost they've literally lost the memory of of the specifics of the horror um, of part of the horror that they have experienced. And so to have this audio from different periods and of different types stitched in, to the narrative, you know, kind of mirrors the ways that like our memories and our the narratives we, you know, create for ourselves are stitched together. I found it so interesting when we talk about like horror and the ways that horror functions or exists um, in different communities. One of the questions we ask is, you know, where is the horror located? Like, what is the source of the horror? And so the way that this show emphasizes that for these Black people, it is not just like these devil pig dog things that come running through um, the woods, um, but it it is every racist sheriff. It is, you know, every um, dining establishment owner, you know, who you don't know is going to, you know, sick his buddies on you. It's, you know, the good old boys in a pickup truck, you know, chasing you down. Like that is the, that is the first horror of this show and it is in many ways the most enduring and most um the, the scariest you know there's mm-hmm. something about like the the unthinking attack on you know tick and his friends and family in this show by the creatures that you're like because it's at that point fairly standard horror there's a way in which you can understand what's happening but a rational brain cannot wrap its head around the kind of violence um, and evil represented by the white characters in this show towards the the 
you know, Black people. You know, like, we simply can't understand it in a way that we can understand, like, animals kind of, you know, like predator prey. But you can't understand, uh, as you know, this sheriff in Danbury or wherever they are at that point, you know, being like, you got seven minutes mm -hmm. to get out of this county. And then that, that gut-churning fear as he chases them, you know? Yeah. On that country road. And, where and, just, and, and, yeah. and there's that catch-22 of like, I can't speed because he'll pull me over, you know? But we're not going to make it if if we go at the speed limit. Like, we just have to pray to Providence that we make it out, you know, that we escape this dude's clutches. It feels like they do a really good job in a relatively short amount of time um, with both the scene you're talking about and what Carolyn was talking about and just so much of the first episode of mm -hmm. showing the the exhaustion of being dehumanized constantly, mm -hmm. right? Like, it is it's unrelenting and it's, you know, it's, it's the reality of these characters, but it's the reality of, of, of American life for a lot of people. Right. And I think mm -hmm. there is something about the combination of this show being just beautiful. Like it's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. that there are so many gorgeous shots in that first mm -hmm. episode. Um, yeah. um, uh, tied with what you're talking about, this sort of unrelenting exhaustion. Like it's hard to watch. Mm -hmm. One thing that, um, I was ignorant about was sundown t like cities, sundown towns. Sundown. Mm -hmm. Um, I, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh I thought, sorry that you said something. Um, I wasn't consciously aware. Like I didn't really know about them. And what I've been seeing on Twitter is that these towns still exist in America. Oh, for sure. Um, <laughs> and like, you know, having that context while watching this and, and being able to draw those parallels of like, yeah, this isn't like gone. This isn't just something that happened in this period of time, right? This isn't just mm -hmm. like a, a a moment in Jim Crow like era America, um, t which is tied with what we were talking about at the beginning of this of like, you know, the the way that the sheriffs like set them up and the way that the sheriffs were like, we know that we hold power over you and we're going to watch you squirm. Um, mm -hmm. Like all of that is still present. It, it's not like it's gone away. At all. Yeah, I I had the um the really horrific and you know unsettling experience of I watched both episodes back to back um last night and so you know I finished watching the first episode and then was gonna take just like a you know quick bio break before starting the second one and um that's when I clicked over to Twitter um and saw the news about Jacob Blake's you know let's call it what it is you know lynching attempted lynching. Um, at the hands of the Kenosha PD. And it was, um, I, I felt so deflated. I am under no illusions as a Black woman in this country as to the worth assigned me, you know, by this, you know, capitalist white supremacist state. I, I know uh, the danger that I'm, that I'm in. But there is a way in which I can... I allow myself to be seduced by um, the illusion of justice or resolution. Um, and it is so often offered by our, our fiction, by our media, by the stories that we tell. And so after, you know, holding my breath and, you know, gripping the furniture um, as I watched Tick and, you know, um, George and Letty, barely escape with their lives in episode one, but end up at a place where you think, okay, maybe they can at least breathe for a moment. And then to turn on the news and be confronted yet again um, with the way that this is the reality of this. It was, it was too much, you know, it was, it was simply too much. Um, I don't I don't know that people can honestly like if you are not uh, if you are not part of a community that has your very existence, you know, called into question and always, you know, at the whim of someone else. I, I don't know that you can understand what it is like to constantly be aware that your life is not yours, you know? I think, you know, Carol, you were talking about like the the sort of like great American um you know, like road trip feeling, you know, mm -hmm. this idea of like, 
you know, just being out on these open roads and, you know, listening to music and soaking it in these grand open vistas. But the way that this show reminds us that this is not available to everyone and not just, you know, not available to, you know, black people or people of color, but also like, if you don't look the way people assume, you know, it's normative, you know, like if you're not cisgender, oh, yeah, you know, absolutely, like, absolutely. you know, yeah, you know, like, are you going to be able to stop somewhere and use the fucking bathroom? Right. You know, like questions that not everybody. Ha- and it's just it's infuriating. And so one of the things that happened in the first episode is and then as I, you know, turn on Twitter, it's like I had to wrestle with my fury. I was so angry. I was so angry and I'm watching this episode and I'm, I I can tell the difference between reality and fiction, y'all, trust me. But I was praying for the death and the painful death of these men who had taken it upon themselves to terrorize Tick and Letty and George. And it was so... um, unsettling to recognize that in myself. I'm I'm a I'm accustomed to and I'm, you know, well aware of, you know, the ways in which I can, you know, tap into my my righteous anger. But this kind of like v- need for vengeance, like bloody vengeance, you know, hit me in the face. Such that when the sheriff and his good old boys are, you know, brutally dispatched um by those creatures, I felt very little sense of like human loss, you know, and I'm uncomfortable with that because I don't want to be the sort of person who doesn't see the humanity of other people, Mm -hmm. but the fury I felt and that I still feel right now, you know, like there's, there's, there's no difference between what happened to Tick on that road, those country roads, and what happened to Jacob Blake and what happened to George. But there is no difference. Yeah. And why do you have to be the bigger person? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, not not to distill that amazing thing that no. you just said down, but I think mm-hmm. that like you no, have to exactly control your you know? rage and your and your feel, you know, your adequate your um appropriate feelings to being dehumanized constantly mm-hmm. when they, you know, yeah. not that life is fair, but yeah. All right. On that note, why don't we take a break? Let's take a break. Yeah, let's do that. Hey, Feminist Frequency Radio heads. Falls upon us and times are pretty uncertain. But you know what is a sure thing? Each week, the Feminist Frequency crew will be here to chop it up and talk over each other about what's been happening in the world of pop culture and media. And you can be part of making the media criticism you love. You can. Head on over to patreon.com slash femfreak and become a patron of all this tasty feminist media analysis. Backers of the podcast get early access to show episodes, merch discounts, exclusive bonus episode hijinks, Anita's pickling recipes, and more. Check it out. Patreon.com slash femfreak. Welcome back. Now it's time to talk about more things <laughs> that are giving us feelings. Um, you know, it's our weekly freakouts. Carolyn, what do you got for us? Well, um, I'm going to talk about a few films that I watched on the Criterion Channel website. But first, I do want to mention that there was a great, there is a great um, piece in the New York Times about the Criterion Channel. So the Criterion Channel, for anyone who who isn't like already familiar, is a sort of prestige um, uh, film um, series. They, they It is an organization, a company that gets the rights to certain films that they deem worthy of, you know, special treatment, and they put out these elegant editions. And so it's they're sort of like just being accepted, having your film in the Criterion Collection carries with it a great deal of, like prestige, right? And so you have um, a lot of uh, like Wes Anderson films are in the Criterion Collection, for instance. Right? And like for like there are a lot of legitimately great films in the Criterion Collection, and a lot of great like world cinema too, like a lot of w- wonderful Japanese films and you know cinema from around the globe. However, the New York Times did re- did just put out a a, a story that uh, uh, with, with the headline is 
why are there so few Black directors in the Criterion Collection? And it's really important to acknowledge that the Criterion Collection has failed tremendously in terms of um, recognizing the great Black cinema. I mean, you know, there's like a few, you know, like Do the Right Thing by Spike Lee and like a few other films, of course, are in the Criterion Collection. But just statistically, you know, if you look at it across the board, like there is a real lack of Black representation in the Criterion Collection. Um, And the conversation around it this week has been really interesting. Like, obviously, we shouldn't give one label the authority to determine like what is and isn't great cinema etc like and there are other labels etc that have that have done better in that regard but anyway it's something that's very important to engage with having said all that um i I will briefly mention i do find cinema something rejuvenating and humanizing in these very difficult times these isolating times and um there's a, a series on the Criterion Channel website uh, right now um, called Three by Mia Hansen Love. Mia Hansen Love is a mm. French is a French director, and her three films um, on the website currently are called um, The Father of My Children, Goodbye First Love, and Things to Come. And they're all very sort of naturalistic French uh, just dramas that follow characters through, as they go through. Uh, you know, periods of their lives for a while. Uh, things of great significance in their lives happen, but they're very like observant films. They're not um, formulaic films. Things to Come features a wonderful performance by a uh, renowned actor, Isabelle Huppert. Um, but all three films are wonderfully acted, very human, and are exactly the sort of films that when I'm feeling disconnected from humanity and like I just want to observe people being people and having relationships with each other and interacting with each other and being like immersed in the stuff of life and, you know, love and lo- loss and heartbreak and joy and beauty and sadness and all the rest of it. Um, these three films are exactly um, the kinds of films that I find so so great to escape into it uh, in those times. So um, check out that series on the Criterion Channel 3 by Mia Hansen Love. Awesome. Thanks, Caro. Mm-hmm. I could listen to Caro talk about film oh. for probably an hour a day, <laughs> maybe more, but at least an hour. Like if you had a daily show, I would tune in and it would just be so interesting. I love the way you talk about them. Well, thanks, Ebony. I really appreciate that. Really. All right, um, am I next? You are. Um, okay, so keeping with the theme of dark horror, because who 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 cares about sleep, right? Um, I just read the first um, installment of a serialized novel called Rust by an author new to me named Christopher Ruse. Ruz, I'm not sure. I think it's Ruse, R-U-Z. Um, he is Australian. He writes um, science fiction, fantasy, dark horror. <clears throat> I think he's a pretty young dude. Anyways, it, I was astounded by how good the writing was. It reminded me of kind of the best of um, Stephen King, who at his best, it, you, like you can't deny his talent. There's, <laughs> there's shit that like we definitely could talk about when it comes to Stephen King. Like, his insistence upon a magical Negro, you know, his, mm. like, incredible fat phobia. But the dude can write his ass off. Christopher was doing something, like, uh, or achieving something very similar, which is um, the the kind of steady, dawning, creeping horror um, of this book um, was just phenomenal. So just to give you a, a quick sense, the the story begins, or it's, it's about um, a woman named Kimberly Archer, who is pushed in front of a subway, a train, and then wakes up in a town she does not recognize, married to a man she does not know, in a house um, that is not hers, um, being told that the life that she believes you know, the life that she remembers is not real and is a product of um, postpartum depression. Um, there's a, a new baby in the house that she is being told is hers. And so the story is about her trying to make her way back to her real life, but also, you know, convince someone, anyone that she's not ill, 
Um, and the, the, the growing realization that there's something very, very wrong with uh, Rustwood, which is the name of the town. It is really, really creepy. It is extraordinarily gross. Um, <laughs> but it is, it is, it is so good. Um, and so if you are, you know, someone who's looking for, like, I, I read this, I almost in, in one sitting, um, it was, it was that compelling. Um, it's called Rust. Um, it's by Christopher Rose and it, I believe it's in four, um, installments. So I've only read the first one so far. I cannot wait, um, to read the second one. It was, it was so amazing. Um, and the, the book is billed as being in the style of, you know, Cronenberg, Lynch and Stephen King, but also l very Lovecraftian, very Lovecraftian <laughs> there monsters <we> <laughs> in this book. So if you're down with Lovecraft country, I think you will really enjoy Rust. Nice. Uh, I would like to freak out about a book as well. Um, it's called Gods of Jade and Shadow by Sylvia Ooh. Moreno Garcia. Yes. The cover is delightful. Have you read it, Ebony? I have not. It's next on my list. Is Sylvia mm. Moreno Garcia the same woman who wrote Mexican Gothic? Or am I yes. mixing up two? Yes. No, okay. same person. I haven't read that one yet. I'm excited to. Yeah. Um, Gods of Jade and Shadow, the little blurb, like the short blurb, the like logline blurb is the Mayan god of death sends a young woman on a harrowing, life-changing journey in this one-of-a-kind fairy tale inspired by Mexican folklore. So if that doesn't hook you already, I mm -hmm. have no hope for you. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed this. It was super fun. I read it really fast because I just wanted to know what happened next. Um, you know, it it is very fairy tale-like, but sort of rooted in... And not fairy tale like Disney at all. Um, but it does start with Cassiopeia, who is, um, you know, stuck cleaning the ch like doing the chores of her wealthy grandfather who treats her like crap, and her um, her her cousin who treats her like garbage as well. And she just fantasizes about getting out. And she you know doesn't understand why her mother doesn't fight harder to get away from this. Um, you know, this life and all of that. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, she opens this chest and her life completely changes. Uh, I again, I really enjoyed it. Lots of incredible visuals, really interesting characters. Um, it's got a little bit of that video gamey vibe where it's like, okay, we're gonna go here and then we're gonna go here and then we're gonna go here. <laughs> but it's not um video gamey in other ways. Uh, I will say the only thing about it, um I, I don't want to I'm going to avoid spoilers because i I really enjoyed it. There is like there is a minor romancy part that is a little twilighty that kind of made me uncomfortable but they don't but the other doesn't handle it badly like twilight does i think that they handle it very well mm -hmm. if it had to have been included if that makes sense um so that was the only thing that i was like i don't know about all this anyways that will make no sense to anyone if you haven't actually read the book but i don't want to <laughs> i don't want to give anything away because it you know it i it's very it's very fun uh it's a very fun read so mm. um yeah that's gods of jade and shadow by sylvia moreno garcia awesome all right y'all you can submit your own freak out at feministfrequency.com slash freak out that's f-r-e-q-o-u-t Thank you so much for listening to Feminist Frequency Radio. Stay tuned for the Freakin' After Party, which is only available to backers of this podcast, which you can learn more at patreon.com slash femfree. This show is engineered by Rob Para. Carrie Simpson provides technical support and artwork is by Jamie Barron. Our intro music is by Phil Circus. Join us next week for another feminist dive into pop culture where we will talk about I May Destroy You. Thanks for listening. Bye. <laughs> oh, later. Sorry. Yeah. Later. I'm sorry. I was so into it. Bye, y'all. Yeah. <laughs>